If you're looking to rebuild connection in your relationships, then you should check out the Adventure Challenge. It's a mysterious scratch-off book with 50 unique and creative adventures where you don't know which one you'll do until you scratch it off. The ultimate goal is to inspire connection in your relationships through adventure and fun. They have three editions, one for couples, one for families, and one for friendships. So if you're feeling in a rut and in need of an adventure to reinvigorate your relationship, this book is perfect to get you out of your normal routine and to have some fun. Head on over to theadventurechallenge.com and use code CONNECT15 to get 15% off the Adventure Challenge books. Welcome to the Communicate and Connect podcast for military relationships with your host, Elizabeth Polinski, a military marriage counselor. If this is your first time listening to the Communicate and Connect podcast, please take a second to go rate, review, and subscribe to make sure you get all our future episodes. We also really want to know what it is you love about our podcast. And if for some reason you're not loving it, we want to know that too, because we're committed to providing the best quality content to help you improve your relationships. You're listening to episode 12, Surviving Long Distance and Immigration. For this episode's show notes, see www.elizabethpolinskylcsw.com. Hi, everyone. This is Liz Polinsky with the Communicate and Connect podcast, and I'm really excited because today we have Rachel with us, who is a military spouse, and she has really has a very unique story, I think, and has been around and through all of the military things for quite a long time. But I, I don't want to tell her story for her. So, Rachel, why don't you take a second to introduce yourself, um, and then I'm going to want to hear about the love story. Okay, absolutely. Well, my name is Rachel. I have been married to my sailor now for 22 years this past March. We have three, congratulations. <laughs> we have three children. Um, our oldest is 24, and he's actually a sailor himself now. Um, and then we have our 20 year old son and our nearly 18 year old daughter. So we are we have been through the trenches, and we are slowly coming out the other side. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to want to know about like what those trenches were, but maybe first tell us about the love story. Cause I just, I love love stories. They make me feel like all nice and gooey inside. And, <laughs> and so I like hearing about them. Absolutely. Yeah. We, um, so we met when I was 15. Uh, we were both living in Canada at the time. We fell in love pretty quickly. We ended up having our first son just after I turned 17. So it was definitely hard. We had to make some decisions in terms of what our future would look like. And we decided mm-hmm. that time to take a break and see what was going to happen. He went to boot camp and A school. He was an ABE. So he was a flight deck guy. Uh, for the Navy. He was brand spanky new to the Navy. So, I mean, zero money, zero upon zero dollars. Yeah. Um, we ended up uh, coming back together just before our son was born. Uh, we ended up marrying during my senior year of high school, my spring break of senior year. We got married and he was deployed, I believe it was about a month after he left on his very first deployment. Um, this was 1998. So, pre-Skype and email and uh, all that good stuff. We had none of that. We, um, we Actually, we had these little tape recorders, and we would send miniature tapes across the seas. Oh, wow. That's such a – that's so creative. Yeah. It was. It was definitely – the only problem was that we had – it was a six-month deployment. Uh, deployments were pretty routine back then. It was uh, six months out. They would come back in like clockwork. Obviously, this was pre-9-11. Yeah. Because of the way the mail worked, I mean, we would have fights that would last for months. And, you know, because I would say some offhand comment and then it was, you know, what did you mean by that? But of course, I didn't get that until like a month later. And so it was uh, was hard. It was really, really hard. We we definitely struggled. I struggled a lot during that first deployment. I became kind of a recluse. I was afraid to leave home because, you know, what if he called? You know, you live and die by seeing those letters come in. But then, you know, he calls me from. You know, Hong Kong and Australia, and I'm dealing with a toddler and loneliness. And 
he's going on and on about, you know, him and his friends going to this great bar and, you know, you see these pictures of him having fun. And while you don't, you know, begrudge him having some levity uh, during such a crap time, when you're 19 with a toddler uh, away from your spouse, all you see is, oh, he just, he loves this, hates me. Like it was, it was hard. Yeah. It was really, really He's hard. He's living the life while you're, you're yeah. a new mom at home and struggling. Yeah, it was, it was rough. And I didn't have a support system. You know, nowadays girls and guys have, you know, online communities that they can connect with. I obviously didn't have that. And I was living in Canada at the time, and we didn't really have a reference for this type of military structure. So there was no FRG, no ombudsman, nowhere for me to know what was going to happen. Um, This would obviously rear its ugly head. Uh, So we went to the 98 deployment. He came home. It was roses and happiness. But life comes back, right? You have that honeymoon high of, oh, my God, he's here. Um, followed by the crash of, okay, well, life is still happening and we still have to, you know, pay bills. And, you know, because he went from his parents' house to the Navy, you know, certain things he didn't understand, like why did groceries cost so much or what was this electricity bill for? Like it was, yeah. it was a learning curve for him too. Um, and we were geo batching at the time. So I was still living in Canada um, because of immigration costs. We lived in, I was in BC, Canada. He was in Washington state. So he would come home sometimes on the weekends. Uh, and again, it was this constant struggle of, I knew he had a crappy day at work. Like I knew his days on the ship. He was on the, uh, the Lincoln at the time. And I knew it was hard. I knew that that was not a fun life. But when he came home, I would word vomit all over him with how much I missed him and wanted him and all this stuff. So, and he just wanted, I mean, he was a punky, I think he was what, 22 at the time, maybe 23. So, I mean, he was still, you know, young dude who wanted to see his friends when he came home yeah. and all this stuff. So it was hard. It was really, really hard. We ended up um, having what I call the deployment baby. So our second son was born, uh, you know, so many months after that deployment ended uh he was born in 99 and uh we it it was a it was again it was another adjustment at the time my husband was considering transitioning out of the military and going back to school obviously i was filled with fear because at this point i was high school educated only and uh, now had two small children and no job. So it was it was scary. He ended up staying on the Lincoln for five years and one month exactly. Okay. And then he was in the reserves and he ended up going to school to get his bachelor's. He, uh, he went to Western Washington. It, it was during the time of the old GI Bill. So it was, a, mm-hmm. it was a struggle. There was no BH with the old GI Bill pre 9-11. It only paid for three years. He needed four years in a chunk. So it was, it was hard. We, we struggled. It was a white knuckle period. Plus he still had his reserve duties. So he would go to the base and all this. So it was hard. And even when he graduated, it was, it was rough. It was a really rough period. It was, yeah, it was not fun. I will back up though. Um, when he, when we had our son, our second son, he was still in the Navy. He deployed right after our second son was born. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he was deployed during the coal. Uh, when the USS Cole got bombed, and this is this kind of led into my uh, passion later on to be you know to be involved in FRG, um, to be involved in the community because I remember sitting at home uh, in Canada with my two small boys staring at the TV, and all the Canadian news said was there was a U.S. Navy ship in the Gulf, which I knew my husband was the head, yeah. of- and there again. I mean, this was two thousand, so. I didn't even own a computer at the time. I was beside myself. I didn't even know who to call. I, I had no one. Like I, that that helpless feeling of the love of my life out there, the father of my sons, and I did not know for a solid day. If yeah, was, that's so if, terrifying. I can't even imagine. Like I, I live. You know, well, it's like 2020 right right now, and we have computers, and my husband was just gone. He, he just got back recently from being out on a boat, and, um, you know, I didn't get to talk to him very often, but it was like every, at least once a week, I got to talk to him on the phone, you know, so I can't, or, or get emails. I can't even imagine just being at home with no, no one to contact, and you're just watching this happen on the TV. That sounds like terrifying. It was, it was absolutely 
awful. So when he decided to get out of the Navy, it wasn't it wasn't that I didn't want him safe. It was just it was a financial thing. I was definitely worried that we were going to struggle. Um, mm-hmm. He stayed in reserves throughout his his education to get his undergrad. And he ended up working for a civilian company right after, but we were broke. I mean, he had a college degree, an engineering degree. He was working for a company associated with Boeing uh, Airlines. And so he was doing like tool design and stuff, very cool work, but like yeah. we had zero upon zero dollars. So he decided to go back active duty. He actually ended up with the exact same job that he ended up with. So it was it was kind of crazy. It was like time had stood still, even though all this had happened. He's always been the man who's wanted more so he he always was looking for the next thing it was uh, I was in awe of him because I was always afraid of like stepping out and you know I think in that way we definitely complement each other where you know I'm very much behind the scenes and just want things to be okay and he wants the next best thing and he kind of pushes me to be better and I kind of keep him grounded and what reality is, but he defied the odds and found a program that would allow him to get his master's degree in public health. So we, while he was serving, like he yeah. did that at the same time. Yep. He, it was, uh, it's the medical procurement, I believe. So he was an ABE. So nothing to do with medical at all. Right. He's not yeah. a foreman. He's like, he was a, an arresting gear guy. So literally like the gear dog, right? Greasy gear dog guy. And he he found this program, this very random program that was allowing people to apply to have their master's degree. He ended up um, getting accepted to the University of Southern Florida. And so in 2013, with our three children, we set off for uh, West for Florida. That was interesting. We immigrated as a family. So me and the children finally immigrated to the to the United States uh, in 2006. Very expensive, very complicated process. I have a lot of feelings about the immigration process, yeah. but it was it was hard, you know, and, and every hardship that we had to encounter, whether it was, you know, having our next baby or immigrating or job stuff, it, 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 it has the ability to tear you apart. We, we would fight. And I mean, you know, just screaming matches. I think we've both threatened divorce several times on both of our and I mean to the point where I remember being pregnant with our daughter and I was about six weeks away from having her and we were having the conversation of yeah we're both miserable let's let's cut bait like we just we were done you know we just we were young you know and when you're young and you had a lot of stressors I would say like any any relationship when there's more stress in going on uh, in life, when there's more stress in life, it puts stress on the relationship. Uh, so you were, you were young, but you also had a lot going on. It, you know, a lot of couples don't have to deal with immigrating, yeah. like military couples. And <laughs> that's actually a question that I have for you. I, this is something that I don't, I don't know a whole lot about. And I'm, I'm thinking there might be other people who don't know about this. But I, I am wondering about how he was a Canadian working in the U S military and if, and that you weren't allowed to move with him, that is an area that I don't quite understand. So I was hoping you might be able to explain a little bit more about how he was with the U S military instead of the Canadian military or, or, and why you weren't able to move with him. Yeah. So he, um, his mother actually was American. Uh, She lived uh, in the States. So I believe she was, like 10. So she missed the cutoff. So the the way the immigration law works is if you have a parent that was in the States, um, so long as they lived in the States until they were 14 or older, they can apply to sponsor you basically to become a citizen of the country. Okay. His mom uh, did not do that. So he had, he had it, but sort of like he had to get very creative. It was, it was a long process from the time that he decided to go into the Navy. And I mean, for him, it was a total lark. I mean, he was, like I said, uh, I think he barely passed high school. I, I, I compared our two high school transcripts and it was pretty scary. I had like all these A's despite being a, you know, breastfeeding mama in the last two years of high school. Yeah. He got like a P in English 12. So like they just said, Oh yeah, fine. Just, you can go. <laughs> um, but, but so, he he showed them, I mean, he went and he got a master's in public health, which is not an easy task. Yep. He, um, <laughs> He's definitely, but that's just him, right? He is Mr. If you tell me I can't do it, I'm going to do it twice. So he, there's no money 
to be made in the Canadian military at all. I mean, if you are an officer in the military and that's the way that you uh, provide for your family, uh, you can qualify for social assistance. So he knew that that wasn't going to be an option for him. And he, he, you know, I mean, he grew up on an eighties child. So, you know, top gun Mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Right. So that was just his goal. He found um, people that were willing to help him, but it took him about two years from the time that he decided to do it to the time he actually like left for boot camp. It was about a two year process. Now for spouses, it's not as cut and dried. We were lucky. So Pre-9-11, it was not happening. Um, In order for me to immigrate, I would have had to apply for a green card. And while applying for a green card, I had to stay put in Canada, right? Could not leave. And it was just at that time really expensive. After 9-11, we were able to do what was called a K-1 visa, basically saying we've already paid the money for the green card and we're going to live in the States while we're waiting for that decision. Okay. Uh, It was definitely interesting. Steve, in the meantime, while this was all happening, Steve actually became a citizen in 2002. Because post 9-11, the laws changed for him to be able to get his citizenship pre the 10-year mark. Before then, you had to be in the country for 10 years. So he was able to become a citizen. Oddly enough, I was pregnant with our daughter when he became a citizen. So... The way it ended up working out is I had to enter the States with a K-1 visa and then get a work permit. And if I wanted to get, uh, if I wanted to work, uh, the boys uh, had K-1 visas until they could um, become naturalized. Our daughter was able to obtain a consular birth abroad certificate stating that because her father was a citizen at the time of birth, she was also a citizen. So oh, wow. yeah, it's like this mishmash. So of like, fascinating. What? <laughs> yeah. And I just, I just am like in shock maybe because, you know, I think a lot of military spouses, you know, or talk about the difficulties of being separated because of deployment, but then you guys are separated, not just from deployment, but even when he is at home, so to say, you're separated, you're separated by country lines in a way. Yeah. And until you guys were able to live in the US with him. Yep. It wasn't until 2000 and yeah, 2006, 2007, uh, when we immigrated down to San Diego, <clears throat> when he decided to go back into the Navy after school. So we were living in San Diego. Now, bear in mind, I was definitely a homebody living in a fairly small town in Canada. You know, I, I had only lived in two places, right? I lived in uh, one town and then the town right next to it, right? I I knew all the same people, you know, and then all of a sudden I'm now driving myself and my children with my husband down to San Diego. And I was terrified. I was that spouse who was like, I'm never leaving the house. I mean, my family was all like, you're going to get shot in a drive-by because apparently all of California is like Compton. Um, Uh So it was, it was definitely a learning curve and I struggled. It was, it was hard, you know, as much as I love my husband, as much as I wanted to be with him full time to have to, to immigrate and be in a country that I'm not used to and, and things. And, and yes, Canada and the U S are very, very similar. So it's not as though I moved from like, uh, you know, uh, Bangladesh and then came to, yeah. it, you know, very, very similar culture wise, but there are differences that I still to this day after all these years, I still struggle with, you know, politics is a big one. You know, I don't understand the political system. So it's hard for me. I don't. um, The medical system is very confusing to me still. Like I remember when my husband was working for a civilian job and he came home with his binder. Bear in mind, I had been universal healthcare all my life and he handed me this blue cross binder. And I'm like, what's a copay? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, very. some of those systems are so different. It is. if I want to ask a question real fast, like how long were you guys together, but separated by that country line before you went to San Diego or, or California? I don't remember if you said it was San Diego or San, yeah, yeah. Something. It was San Diego. Um, I, I would say probably the first six years of our marriage, we were separated. And then before then it would have been boot camp and stuff. So I would say all together before I immigrated, probably a good 10 years. Wow that we would see yeah. radically. Now that is a long distance relationship <laughs> if I've ever heard one, 10 years. Oh my God. Yeah. It wow. Was, it was hard. And, you know, it's at every stage kind of uh, created a new thing. You know, when we finally um, 
got to the place where he was in grad school and getting his master's paid for by the Navy. At that point, uh, obviously living in the country for a couple of years now, I had managed to establish myself working from home. Um, I'm a big proponent on wives uh, becoming educated on the different avenues that they can have a hustle. Not nothing MLM. I'm, uh, and I apologize to any of your listeners that do have an MLM. I just. What do you I, mean MLM? Um, uh, multi-level marketing. So your like pampered chef type style. Gotcha. You know, I definitely uh, I'm a huge advocate of uh, you know, military spouses finding career paths that are like actual careers. And it took me a long time to figure it out, a lot of trial and error. But I um, ended up working from home. My husband left for deployment in 2007. And I was alone in San Diego. I started getting involved with the FRG for my husband's command. And I really loved it. I love being able to connect with spouses and to help them. I went to Compass. If anyone is living in an area and they need to connect, Compass, go compass.org is a lifesaver. I don't care how long okay. your husband has been in, go. <laughs> it is, it's a treasure. I know it's hard during these times and like the dumpster fire that is 2020, but um, yeah. A uh, compass is an amazing class. It's not based on rank. It's just spouse, uh, spouse to spouse mentoring everything from how to read an LES to local attractions to managing money. It's an amazing organization. But uh, yeah, so I ended up uh, figuring out how to work from home, uh, mostly in the technology field. Again, I'm not a computer science person, no degree, still high school only. Um, but I ended up you know, kind of working my way up through the ranks of work from home. And I did everything from Eddie Bauer catalog support um, to a clinical research company that did the one of the clinical trials for Latisse, like the I, uh, I, uh, yeah. I thing. Um, and now I am the operations manager for a scheduling software company. So it, it is possible to have a career and love someone in the military. But I think in terms of like love and, and career, it's you just you have to adjust your expectations. Are you going yeah. to have the life that you thought you were going to have when you were little and planning weddings and what this would all look like? No, it's not the movies. It's not, you know, yes, when they come home from deployment, you hear that music swelling in your ears. You hear like whatever love song it is, whether it's, you know, symphony or Celine Dion in my case. <laughs> you hear the music I'm smiling so big right now. You can't see me, but I'm smiling big because that's that's like, yeah, it does feel like that, doesn't it? It's just like this euphoric feeling. But that ends, you know, you have that high of that honeymoon period and, and you have to figure it out. And I think that a lot of wives and, and husbands now too struggle with that expectation. You know, you have to you you have to meet somewhere in the middle. You know, you can have a fulfilling life and love someone in the military. But there's going to be a lot of sacrifice on both your sides. You know, he he now has to decide on his next duty station and he's trying to keep it within the lower 48 as much as possible so that I can keep working my job, you know. And so far we've been pretty successful, but it, it's, it's a struggle. But I will say, you know, this last deployment was our umpteenth deployment, but he got to deploy with his son. So the son that he left behind on his very first deployment yeah. was the son that was on the ship with him. They were both stationed on the exact same ship. That's such a special experience. Yeah. They got to do uh, port calls together. I got pictures of them in Dubai and, and uh, Thailand. It was it was amazing having those two come off the ship at the same time. And I was thinking back to like my very first homecoming with him and then I had my son and it was just, yeah, I was a ball of emotion, I believe, that whole month. But again, then the reality, right? Now I still have, you know, a son who went through his very first deployment at a young age who, you know, he's a very solid kid, but it, it's still a struggle, you know, and I think that that's, you know, that's the full circle of this military life is that, you know, no matter what age and stage you're at, it, you're going to have to figure out some stuff. So, um, you know, my, my, my other piece of advice for any military spouse who's just starting out and, you know, is all sorts of, you know, the love songs well, is just know that there are going to be some struggles. You know, my husband and I, we love each other and he is my best friend, but we struggled. There was a deployment. He came home uh, one year and he couldn't sleep in our bed. He had to sleep on the couch because he was so used to his rack that being in our bed freaked him out. He couldn't handle it. 
and it was hard. It was hard having a husband who didn't want to sleep in my bed and wanted to sleep on the couch. So yeah, I'm just imagining like that would hit like it, I think it would hit my self esteem in a way. Like, why doesn't my husband want to sleep next to me and want to be with me after he's been gone yep. for such a long time? Yeah, it was it was hard. It was definitely you know you have these amazing moments and you know and I think too now that we have Facebook and Pinterest and all these things, it's like you know I think girls. And, and guys, you know, spend so much time with that, that romance. And then they don't understand that that after part, you know, like you're going to have to being the spouse, it's often up to you. And, you know, the military gives us some tools, but not the best tools to be like, here, we broke them. Can you put them back together again so that we can have them back for work? And it's, it, it's hard, you know, it, it's yeah. a struggle and you, but you figure it out and you live to fight another day, I guess. Yeah, that's that's so interesting that you said that because I don't know that I think that that's a spouse's <laughs> job to put someone back together. You know, yeah, we I pro- we could probably go into a long time on that that idea, but there is kind of that um, assumption. Yeah, I mean, I I have often lamented. I'm like, why aren't there more more tools? You know, there were. We're, we're sent home these people that we, you know, said goodbye to X amount of months ago. And, you know, I have uh, friends of mine who, whose husbands are Marines, right? Boots on the ground. Mm-hmm. And so they leave and then come back and you're, you're struggling because the man that you sent away may not be that same person that you get back. And you have to find a way to love this new person because while they look and smell the same, they're not always the same there are parts of them that are changed and sometimes those parts will come back and sometimes they don't and it's 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 really really hard and I I definitely feel for wives who get back spouses who are damaged further than what my husband had experienced with his minor PTSD you know it's you you feel so badly for them because the resources while they're there are not super readily available and if they are there's like a stigma you know when our when our husbands yeah. and, and wives are in the military there there can be a stigma attached to asking for help and you know getting more resources for them and it it's hard it's really really hard yeah i can really uh i'm feeling that when you say it right now i think you know most of my work experience was treating ptsd in veterans at the veterans affairs clinic and i have a guest speaker. So actually, it'll be a, in the lineup of podcasts. It'll it'll be before this episode, but I have a psychologist um, who's going to end up coming to talk about, about PTSD and, and the impact that has on families. Um, and you're right, there there is a stigma, especially while you're in the military, about going and getting help after you've experienced something that's been traumatic. But from a mental health standpoint, PTSD is actually a very natural, normal reaction. It's your body doing what it should do in response to a life-threatening event. Um, and I wish, yeah, I wish more people <laughs> understood that because it it's not a mental health, you know, we, we diagnose it as a mental health disorder, but it's not like something's wrong with you the way that maybe people feel like other other mental health diagnoses might be. This is just a very natural response to your body, your body going through a life threatening event. Wow. That's, and that's a very interesting because I've never heard it described that way. That's a natural thing. You know, I, I, for the first time reached out for mental health help when we were living in 29 Palms and I had finally kind of, you know, I was hitting 40 and just, you know, all the life changes and I ended up seeing a health professional who diagnosed me as having uh, extreme PTSD because I would get very startled easily, even when my husband. Yeah. Came. And it felt at the time like a, not like a death sentence or anything, but you just, you feel like, oh, well, I'm just broken. Like that now I'm, now I know I'm broken. And it, is it, I've never heard it described that way. That's a very, I wish more people would describe it that way. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I can describe it this way for you too, because, um, yeah, it's it's really just like like a a button that's pushed on, uh, maybe. Uh, so you're you're just you're on alert for danger now, mm-hmm. and uh, it's just it's really just like you know your body. What I'm getting mixed up on my words, but your body pushes on that button 
saying, hey, we got to look out for danger because you've been in a lot of danger and life-threatening experiences and it just stays on. And the, the thing is, is that when people come back or after a life-threatening type of event, that button just, it didn't unpop out, you know, it, it stayed popped in. And so they stay on alert looking for the danger, which is the body's natural response. And so a lot of it is, is helping people realize that they they aren't in danger now and helping the body kind of like let go of that on button. That's really cool. I, I, you know, it, it, it definitely, I wish more people like you were talking about that because it is, you know, when you're a spouse and you hear, like I have a girlfriend of mine whose husband actually is a, a he works in like the religious services and he mm-hmm. way boots on the ground and, and suffers with PTSD. And, and she, I know she's felt helpless because you just feel like they're, well, now we know they're broken, you know, and there's just this, yeah. of, well, now they're broken. And now how do I fix it? And I think, you know, one thing I had to learn along the way, definitely trial and error is I can't fix him, but I can definitely make it so that when he's home, that I try to not be the one thing that's like hard for him. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I've really become cognizant that my words mean a lot to him. Um, you know, when I say things kind of off the cuff or whatever, it's, you know, I've learned that, you know, even though he is a man and he's a manly man that, you know, some things hurt. And I, I yeah. be very, very cognizant of that. And it's, you know, I, I, like I said, I've known this man now for 25 years of my life and we're still figuring it out. Like, you know, we're still entering new phases and stages. And every time we do, it's like, we've got a, it's almost like renegotiating the, the marriage contract. You know, we got married absolutely super young and we decided a long time ago like look you know especially that last time that we were on the brink of divorce and we just made this cognizant decision that you know if we wanted to do this for the long haul we you know, we were committed to actually staying together we were going to have to renegotiate what marriage looked like at these different stages because it, you know being in the trenches with little kids is very different than where we're at now with growing children who where our last one is getting ready to graduate high school our middle son is going to be graduating college and, you know, this will probably be the last house where we have people that we created living with us full time. So it's, yeah. uh, it's that whole renegotiation. It is. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And I think you are, are like proof. I mean, you guys have been together for, for so long, proof that, that relationships can work and that they do require renegotiating what the relationship looks like. I, I often think, you know, you're really dating multiple people throughout your marriage, um, because you both are growing individually, um, and as a couple, and you have new interests, you develop, you know, you may go through different periods of, like, having a psychological growth period, or um, go through, like, a fitness uh, phase, or, you know, we all, we all have different phases and, and ways that we grow. And so you could really be with different types of people, they're all still your spouse, but there are different versions of your spouse as you go along. Absolutely. So I like that. I like that you talked about renegotiating and you guys have clearly been pretty successful at that. um, If you've made it, made it in your marriage this long. Yeah. And so I know, um, so you were talking about uh, you guys are kind of in a new phase. And so maybe that was one of the things you and I had talked about before starting uh, this episode was was kind of switching into the phase of like empty nesters and kids leaving the home. Did you want to talk at all about that? Yeah, it's definitely been something I've thought about a lot. You know, we, as I mentioned before, we were in the trenches of little kids. And, and when you have small children, you really don't think that's ever going to end, right? The the, yeah. the feedings and the diapers and the tantrums, but you know now like, we're, we're we're lucky at this moment. You know, my son, my oldest son, who's a sailor, is still living with us. We were you know because we're all stationed here together. But this will be the last home because of what's happening. You know, with the with my daughter graduating high school and my son graduating college and my oldest deciding whether or not he's going to stay in the navy. So this will probably be the last house that we are all living together. And it, my husband is excited. He is over the moon that, you know, it's just going to be the two of us. I have a lot of anxiety about it. You know, I, 
I, I've never been a Betty Crocker type mom. You know, I've never been, yeah. uh, you know, I love my children, but I was never like, my children are precious gifts. I was like, yeah, this jerk lives with me right now. <laughs> um, but still, you know, I identify a lot of my day to day as a mom. And when that part goes away, it's just going to be the two of us, you know, and I've definitely, well, I know I love him and he's my best friend. You know, that part of our lives is going to be changed you know we will no longer be dealing with you know that that day-to-day stuff so and 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 I really worry about my kids being out of my nest I often say that I'm the happiest when all my chickadees are in my nest uh, with me so it's been I I, I'm 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 worried (laughs) I'm yeah those days are gonna be hard that I think is so so natural to be to be anxious. I mean, you're you're rounding a corner, you know, and it's like I know that this big life change is going to happen, and I don't really know what it's going to look like yet. Mm-hmm. So not only are you worried maybe for yourself and like the life change you're going to have, but your kids are going through a big life change, and how are they going to adjust to it? Also, yep, that makes a lot of sense. And a lot of couples it kind of goes like one of two ways. It's it's usually never like the middle ground with anything in life, I think, you know, uh, is that when when couples kind of end up being empty nesters and they're rounding that corner, like what the research says, it's actually one of the times where couples are the happiest if they can kind of renegotiate their marriage and reconnect again after that then it can actually be one of the times where couples are the happiest and they they enjoy their lives the most. So that's the bright side, I think, of it. I think the the part that is a struggle to get there for some couples is that um, maybe their life has become so much about the family life and the kids. And that's really natural because, I mean, you have kids, you have to take care of them, you know? Um, So... Uh, they, but what they do in their day and their week and their life becomes, you know, what are we doing for the kids? And their relationship as a couple often gets kind of on the side, uh, put on the side burner as they focus more on the family aspects. And one of the big things that I guess couples have to re redo is kind of get to know each other again. Uh, there's a a researcher called um, Dr. John Gottman and his wife, Julie Gottman. She's also a doctor. They, they run the Gottman Institute, but they're one of the big researchers in couples, couples related research. And they talk about something called love maps, which is uh, basically the idea that when you're young and you're first falling in love, you know, you're really interested in your partner and you learn about, you know, what was it like for them growing up? What do they dream about? for their future? Who do they want to be? You know, what are their desires and interests and hobbies? And, and as you go along in your marriage or your relationship, you stop learning about each other. You don't update those, uh, like mental maps of what your partner is like and who they are. And when, when couples get to this stage and their lives have been so focused on their kids and, they sometimes find that they don't have much in common. And so part of reconnecting is learning, having that same type of interest in learning what what are their fears, uh, what are their hopes for the future, what are their goals and interests, turning to each other for support. I think a lot of people feel this anxiety, but they don't talk to their spouse about it, or they, they are realizing oh, I don't have as much in common with my spouse outside of the kids anymore. But it's kind of scary to say that to the person you love. And so they never talk about it. Right. And so I guess if I had to say like three things (laughs) in like a three point bullet, it would be tell your partner that you're anxious about it. Not necessarily you specifically, but like people in general talking about, about it and acknowledging like, yeah, our, we've kind of grown apart or are, we don't know how to reconnect just us without the kids. And then start, number two would be to start showing an interest in, in learning about what this person in front of you is like again, almost like you did when you guys first met. And then lastly, it would be trying to bring in time to spend together again, because I guess, what am I thinking? I'm thinking that for a lot of couples, their lives become about the kids 
And if they have hobbies, they're they're hobbies that they do separately with friends. Often, oftentimes, they don't often have hobbies that they've done together. Um, and so that can be a great way to start pulling in. And uh, I guess I have this image in my mind of like rounding a corner, but of starting to come together again to have these like strands that tie you together uh, in terms of hobbies and activities that you've been doing, creating new experiences for you guys to enjoy together, I think are, are big ways for couples to navigate that transition. Well, I like that. What are you? That's a good, that's a good, I like that imagery of rounding the corner. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, those are kind of like my, my thoughts on, on that. Do you have any thoughts on that that you want to share? Um, no, I actually really, I like the idea of just a lot of communication, you know, making sure. And I mean, that's kind of been the, the thing in our marriage is just, you know, being kind, but honest, you know, learning that, yeah. you know, we can be honest about our feelings, you know, just being kind about it. You know, I try not to uh, lash at him for things that are beyond his control. And that's, you know, that was a big learning thing for me when I was younger, because, you know, when you're younger, obviously romance looks different. And you think that, you know, every fight leads to divorce court, you know, oh, well, we just don't get along. And this has got to be over. Um, you know, obviously, now that I'm older, and somewhat wiser, I know that yeah. you know, people can fight, and it's good and cathartic to get things out so long as it's done constructively. Um, so I think for us, it's just you know, I've learned to not be so closed in with what I'm thinking of. Um, I used to have the internal dialogue, like, oh, he doesn't care. Or he, you know, maybe I don't want to bother him with this. But I have been voicing that, um, my, my anxiety about the empty nest thing um, as much as I can with him. And, and I think he gets it. You know, he tries, I mean, he's Mr. Levity at times where he's like, oh, you know, it'll be fine. You know, he, you know, he just thinks everything is going to click and go. And that's just, you know, how he is, I guess, with yeah. the military guys. It's like, oh, that's just, you know, insert slot A into B and off you go. Um, yeah, my husband's <laughs> like that too. You know, <laughs> so it's can, hard. You know. and, and the longer they're in the military, it definitely, that becomes ingrained. You know, Steve's now been military for, you know, over 25 years. Um, so he, he definitely feels it um, in his in his bones. I don't know if he would ever know how to be a full-time civilian. Um, so, you know, the retirement thing is obviously, you know, he is planning on retiring in the next 10 years um, because now that he's medical, he can stay in. He'll, how does he put this now? He says he's going to age out before he ranks out. Medical Service Corps can stay until like 62. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. He's, he says 55 is his magic number. So we got about like nine, 10 years. But, um, but yeah, just being really open and honest with him and just really trying to make it make it known to him that I'm not afraid of being with him full time. I love him. He's a great guy. I just don't know how that looks for me and for us as a unit, you know, like him on his own. I love him. It's great. But like, how does that look? And I think just making sure that we constantly have those conversations and, um, you know, acknowledge that it's going to be different, you know, good, bad, or ugly. It's, it's gonna, it's gonna be different. And, and knowing that different doesn't always mean catastrophic and awful. <laughs> Yeah. And I think that the thing that you guys have going for you is that you have made it through so many transitions before. So you, you already know how to go through a transition together. This is just the next one. And it's a one that's a little bit different than what you've done before, but it'll be the same skill set that you guys have used to navigate all the other ones. Absolutely. I like that. For those listening, if you were to kind of like maybe give one or two points of advice, um, to young spouses or, or military spouses, or it could be about military or just making it, you know, through 10 years of long distance or uh, just making it to being together for over 20 years. Um, what would be your top points that you would want to share? Absolutely. I would say, um, you know, be, be flexible. Um, I went to one of those compass classes and their big thing was Semper Gumby right? Be always flexible. Uh, and I think that as spouses, we have to do that. You know, it, some things are not always going to be the way you imagine them to be, but that doesn't mean it's the worst thing ever. You know, be flexible, be open. Every duty station that your husband's going to get offered may not be Hawaii, may not be that thing yeah. that you are absolutely excited to do, but you know, you can make it work. Uh, I lived in 29 Palms, California. That is not a fun place to go, but 
I met some amazing people there. So just be open minded, be flexible and know that, you know, you are definitely not alone. If you are feeling or thinking something, um, you know, chances are other people are too. And, and, and just keep your expectations realistic. You know, I think online groups, while being super supportive, can start setting expectations that there's a right way to do this. And there isn't. There isn't one size fits all. Some people have to geobatch. Some people would rather cut off their arms and geobatch. You know, some people have children with special needs and those considerations have to be made. I think, you know, just being kind to each other, you know, us spouses, we have to stick together. You know, whether it's join an FRG, get to know your ombudsman, you know, don't go into a command thinking that the spouse group is going to be this catty, you know, uh, hen club. It, yes, some clubs can be that way. But if you want it to be different, you can make it different. I was a junior sailor spouse and I ended up, you know, changing the way an FRG looked for my command. And I was very proud of what I did. And I think that, you know, if there's that famous quote, you know, be the change that you want to see in the world. So, you know, you need to to stick your hand up and volunteer. And I promise you that getting involved with the community outside of the online realm will make you feel better. It will give you perspective that you can help others who are maybe feeling the same as you. And, and having that sense of community will make the next things easier. Yeah, I just... I just love everything you're saying. I'm I'm sitting here and I'm like nodding my head and I'm thinking, oh yeah, no one can see me. So. <laughs> but I have been like total agreement. So, well, Rachel, this has been so enjoyable for me. I have, I have just loved hearing about your story and, and it's inspiring for me to, to hear about how you guys have made it through so many different struggles, a, a large variety of struggles and are still going strong in your relationship. And um, yeah, thank you so much for, for being on the podcast and, and sharing. Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been uh, a very eye-opening and enjoyable experience. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If so, please take a second to go rate, review, and subscribe so you get all of our future episodes. Make sure to check out the show notes to sign up for our free 10-week relationship email course. This email course is really designed for people who are, are maybe having trouble with communication or connection in their relationship and helping them develop some quick wins right away to start improving it. While I am a therapist, this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not considered therapy. And it should also not be a replacement for therapy. If you think you need a professional of any kind, you should definitely go find one. Until next time.